Hi, everyone, and welcome to ABC's of Anesthesia podcast and on YouTube. Now, today we have Dr. Grant. So, Grant, um, I'll give a brief intro and then, yeah, just uh, just start some questions. But we're going to be talking about everything in, in bypass, which is really something that I think a lot of anesthetists just let happen because there's an expert there. But in your specific circumstance, you did a fellowship in this. So, so Grant, I mean, just to start from the very beginning, Grew up on a farm in the west of Dolby, completed his medical training at James Cook University. He worked as a junior doctor in North Queensland, where he completed his Master of Public Health and Tropical Medicine and his introductory and basic anesthesia training, then moving to Brisbane for advanced anesthesia training, working between quite a few hospitals there. He then undertook a fellowship in cardiothoracic anesthesia and medical perfusion at the Princess Alexandra Hospital with training in transesophageal echo, cardiopulmonary bypass and ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Grant works now as a staff specialist at the PA hospital, privately through several hospitals in Brisbane as well. And he maintains his interest in rural and regional anesthesia through his work on the DRGA. So that's the Diploma of Rural Generalist Anesthesia, as well as ANSCA. Now, that's actually how we met Grant. So I'm really fortuitous that uh, we met on that. But I've never met an anesthetist who does medical perfusion because that wasn't a thing. Um, welcome. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, have, you having me and appreciate the intro. Um, I've never been on a podcast before, so this is a, uh, oh. a new experience for me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, hey, so just to get started, um, now, what are the basics of cardiopulmonary bypass? Like, you know, what is this all about? Why, why are we actually doing this? Yeah, absolutely. So cardiopulmonary bypass um, is a technique uh, that was developed to pretty much does what it says on the tin, really bypass the cardiopulmonary system, the heart and the lungs. And this allows surgeons to operate um, on the heart. Um, and on the great vessels uh, around the heart um, to you know, remedy any pathology that's around them. Yeah, right. And obviously there is the like, you know, non-bypass cardiac surgery. But what's, mm. what's that about then? Is there... Yeah, so, so there is new techniques developed uh, to allow cardiac surgery to proceed without bypass. And it's sort of for um, specific uh, surgeries or specific techniques where bypass perhaps isn't really required. Um, so it has to be pathology and, and patient specific. So things like uh, off pump uh, coronary artery bypass grafting. So for simple uh, bypass grafting cases where um, the maybe the amount of grafts that are needed or the anatomical location of the grafts is amenable to uh, the surgeon operating on the surface of the heart without the heart being arrested and um, without blood flow being ceased to the chambers within the heart, then uh, then they can perform that off pump or without the use of cardiopulmonary bypass. Just thinking about it, like it must have been such a crazy uh you know advancement in science because obviously all other parts of the body aren't moving really there's a bit of diaphragmatic movement with breathing but the heart is full of blood it's constantly moving at a very fast rate so this would not, not none of this would be possible like surgeons just couldn't quite get those stitches in and with that's it the movement right absolutely and if you're if you're interested in the history actually which is incredible because it happened you know within the last 70 or so years this is within a lifetime that all this stuff has happened um, there's an excellent book called uh, King of Hearts by G. Wayne Miller that talks about Walt Lillehei uh, in Minneapolis, who was one of the sort of pioneering cardiac surgeons in America who came up with this. Um, and it reads like a fiction because mm -hmm. just some of this stuff that they do is, is unbelievable, but uh, very trailblazing and, of course, allows what we do today. It's it, Actually, it's surprising that there isn't a Netflix movie on this because this sounds like something that would be, you know, this, you know, you can just see the storyline, patient needs surgery on the heart. They don't know how to do it. This guy comes up with, Let's just stop the heart. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, man. We can pitch it after this to Netflix, I reckon. This would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we've got the rights on this story, don't we? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so, okay, so we're bypassing the heart and the lungs. So obviously we need oxygenation and we need a pump. So, you know, let, let's get into a bit of the physiology. What is the oxygenation about? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So you've correctly identified there that we need a pump. We need something to generate pressure to allow flow. Um, and we need an oxygenator as well to oxygenate the blood. The other things that we need most simply are sort of a drainage line, which is in the form of a venous line, and then a return line, which normally goes in the aorta, the, the central uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. But there are a range of configurations. It can also be peripheral as well in the femoral artery and femoral veins. Um, but for the purpose of this conversation, we'll stick primarily to say, central uh, cannulation for something like a coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Um, but you're absolutely right. So um, oxygenators are sort of a, a um, fantastic invention that's allowed extracorporeal oxygenation. Um, now, these uh, work um, by the sort of diffusion of oxygen uh, through pressurised blood 
um, flowing very, very close to polymethylpentene fibres within an oxygenator that allow diffusion across uh, across the, um, the fibres. Now, uh, these have a much smaller surface area to the human lung, um, but because of the arrangement of the fibres, um, they still work very, very efficiently. Um, so we can get a, quite a long life out of uh, each oxygenator for, for uh, each case, and uh, they still provide very, very good um, oxygenation. This is a huge advancement from the original oxygenators, which were sort of uh, helical glass structures that blood flowed down through countercurrent to bubbles of oxygen that went up through the helical glass. They were called bubble oxygenators. Um, so that's how, they, that's how they first started doing this. And obviously we've come a long way since then in terms of efficiency and reliability with respect to these oxygenators. Right. I've got some, I've got some like stats from the, a BJ article saying like 200 millimeters is the distance in these oxygenators versus, you know, sorry, 200 micrometers versus 10 micrometers distance. So you know, much greater diffusion distances and, you know, around two to, you know, two to three square meters of surface area versus, you know, 70 to 100 square meters in the human lung. So these are, you know, massively different and disadvantages um, kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, profiles here. And if you think yeah. of sort of diffusion, this is, you know, this is not a great situation, but it still works it, it, it well enough. Is that right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and because the blood is pressurized as it goes through the oxygenator, um, and we get such uh, such good flow of that blood, um, it allows uh, allows some diffusion across that membrane. Yeah, and and so okay, that's the oxygenator. Essentially, you've got oxygen through a membrane. It's fixed law of diffusion all over again, uh, and 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 that allows enough oxygenation. How about the pump? Yeah, so the pump itself can take a few different configurations. The, the first type of pump, and a, a commonly used type of pump, is what's called an occlusive type of pump or a roller pump. Um, and this consists of um, sort of soft plastic tubing uh, running through a raceway um, that then has two rollers on each end that um, uh, rotate um, uh, in a circular fashion. Um, these will uh, occlude the um, plastic tubing running through the pump. Uh, allowing displacement of the blood, uh, and that's how force is generated for these occlusive pumps. Um, these are these are in use commonly uh, for cardiopulmonary bypass, um, uh, and uh, they're you know some of the first types of pumps that that, uh, that we used. There's also non-occlusive types of pumps, so things like a centrifugal pump. Um, so these will allow input of blood uh, through the top of a um, centrifuge. Centrifuge will rotate, um, creating velocity of the blood, and then have an output on the uh, the lower lateral side. Um, these non-occlusive pumps have some advantages to occlusive pumps in that there may be less uh, shear stress and trauma to red blood cells, platelets, etc. Um, but uh, they can reach, you know, sort of similar flows depending on the uh, the type of tubing used in occlusive pumps um, and uh, and the type of, of non-occlusive pump used. Those are sort of the main two types of pumps mm. used, uh, used today. It seems almost strange. Like you've got this plastic tubing and you're squishing it round. Obviously, that's mm. going to cause trauma. That's going to cause problems. Like, is that a big problem? Is that something you have to fix? Yeah, yeah. So, occlusive pumps certainly, as I said, can cause a lot of shear stress and trauma to red blood cells and platelets. And it's kind of, uh, as you might imagine, directly proportional to the amount of time that blood is spent <clears throat> moving through that tubing. So, the longer the bypass run, uh, the more potential trauma can be caused. The more potential thrombosis and platelet dysfunction we see once we wean from bypass that then needs to be fixed. Um, the, uh, it, it's also important, of course, to test the calibration of the occlusive pump. So if, if the pump was over-occlusive, then we may cause more trauma due to more crushing of that plastic and more crushing of those red, red cells and platelets. Um, and of course, if it's under-occlusive, then we might not have proper occlusions and we might get a retrograde flow, but the pump might not flow forward all of the time at low flows because of that under-occlusion. Hey, so, I mean, it, just like we invoked, there's a, there's a few principles in the anesthesia you know, fixed law of diffusion, area mm. over, you know, uh, pressure gradient times area over thickness over the square root of molecular weight times a diffusion, diffusion coefficient is mm. fixed law of diffusion. And, and hagen purcell equation is the other very commonly invoked formula, which is pressure differential um, times pi r to the power four over eight times viscosity times length. So really, this blood flow is dependent on pressure over resistance or the hagen purcell equation. Absolutely, yeah. I think everything in medicine comes down to, you know, Ohm's laws and uh, maybe two other laws in there. That's about right. But yes, uh, a cardiopulmonary bypass is no exception. Okay, so great. So you've got an oxygen air, you've got a pump. The pump pushes the um, blood round. Now, <laughs> this is something that always confused me, even doing anesthesia uh, for, for these kind of cases, because I wasn't there directly, 
you know, be, being the surgeon who's um, putting the, the the plumbing in, what do you hmm. need to, what, what does a surgeon physically do to connect the drainage line and then the return line? Yeah, sure, sure. That's an excellent question. Um, I'll say that, of course, in each uh, in each institution, the specific logistics of, of how um, cardiopulmonary bypass is connected to the patient to the table will vary, uh, similar to you know how the more controlling will vary between your hospital and my hospital. But the the basics are all pretty much the same. So I'll talk about it in sort of basic and general terms. But um, the say for a you know central cannulation for a, a coronary artery bypass grafting surgery, um, I'd be remiss not to mention that before uh, any of this occurs. Um, we should have an adequate uh, ACT, uh, so we should be giving a heparin um, and we should be measuring that ACT and we want to see that ACT over 480. So the reference range being 120 to 140, we want to have about 2.5 times to three times that. I know that wasn't the question asked, but it's really, really important that that gets done because that's the thing that really gets perfusionists. Actually, is that the thing? There's nothing else you need to really, really, really do right in anesthesia except get that heparin in and make sure the ACT is above 480. Pretty much, I reckon. If you if you can do that, uh, then you know everything else can kind of get by. But that's that's the thing that uh, that's a non negotiable. And I, and I probably want to highlight this. So you know, I'm going to repeat this because if there's you know uh, you'll be potentially probably a basic trainee, maybe even at a quick care level, but definitely a lot of my advanced training was spent in cardiac theatres, and it really helps you getting all the lines and everything. And and you do feel a little bit useless because there's such complex patients. There's a lot going on. You know, the anaesthetist you know, the specialist is out there putting the toe in and really involved in that. And you're kind of doing all the other bits and bobs for the case. And that's mm. the one thing that you need to get right. So just trust me when we say heparin is the one thing you need to get right. If you get this wrong, then everything else can go extremely, extremely wrong. Because I, I mean, I guess the point is you give that standard dose of heparin. What's, what's the, what is the dose of heparin that you give? So about three to 400 units per kilo. So 300 to 400 units per kilo, you give that dose. And if the mm -hmm. if you're late on measuring the ACT and the surgeon's ready to, to go and you don't have that reading, that it looks like amateur hours. So you have it looks, to- It looks bad. Absolutely. Um, and sorry. Oh yeah, and what timing do you, would you give the heparin? Like, you know, start a kiss? So usually when- well, usually when the surgeon asks for it. So it depends, you know, particularly what, what the surgeon's doing for that specific surgery. But again, to say coronary artery, artery bypass grafting with, uh, say, that maybe they're taking an internal mammary artery. Once they've harvested that internal mammary artery, usually some point to then, um, uh, if a vein graft is being taken as well, then they'll be ready to uh, open the pericardium and insert their lines. And so usually they'll ask for heparin at that point. The heparin will be given three to 400 units per kilo. Um, and then an ACT will be taken about two minutes after that. Uh, and it's it's something that, yeah, you, you don't want to forget. Often if the, the heparin's given and you forget to take the ACT and they look over the drafts and say, how long is that ACT gone? And you go, oh, no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so when you say 300 to 400 units per kilo, it sounds mm. like you should always err on getting a higher than low AC. Would you ever just say, look, let's just give 400 units per kilo. We don't want to ever be lower yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Especially if uh, the patients, uh, if things are moving quickly, you know, if you want to get on bypass quickly, you'll sometimes just give a larger uh, than usual dose just to ensure a margin of safety. Or if the patient may, um, you know, be at risk of heparin resistance or AT3 um, deficiency due to, say, being on a heparin infusion prior to coming um, to the theatre, say, for, you know, angina as an inpatient, uh, then you'll certainly err on a higher heparin dose just to ensure that extra margin of safety. Okay, let, let's talk about that. So if someone's on a heparin infusion previously, for, you know, and this would be pretty common, what dose are you giving then? Yeah, so I'm giving straight 400. Never 500, never going? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll normally give 400 and then and then check, and then I'm more than happy to give more as necessary if the ACT comes a little under what we're uh, what we're looking at. And that'll be a discussion between the, uh, the perfusionist and the need, just obviously keeping the surgeon aware as well um, that, uh, that you know, we're concerned about perhaps heparin resistance in this patient, and so we'll give higher doses. Yeah, okay. What, what is the, I guess, the most resistance someone could be to heparin? Is there some kind of genetic disorder? Is there something else that people should look for in the history or on the investigation? Yeah, so I mean, any any known antithrombin 3 deficiency will be uh, will be a, a big problem because obviously, you know, heparin, the anionic mucopolysaccharide molecule that exerts its effects on 10A3 antithrombin 3. Um, so if there's any congenital deficiency that's that's known about, um, then that's uh, that's something that's, that's very concerning. Um, uh, and so you'd be starting at very high doses of heparin there. Um, and once you've given significant doses up to you know 600 plus units per kilo, if you're still not getting an adequate ACT, um, you can think about uh, potentially um, 
supplementing the patient's antithrombin-3 with either antithrombin-3 concentrate, depending on what your you know, hospital and lab has available, uh, or FFP, because we know that antithrombin-3 still have a, a, a certain concentration in fresh flows and plasma. So we can give patients a, a unit of fresh flows and plasma, check the ACT again, and, and sort of see how they're traveling with respect to anticoagulation. And there's not some kind of routine screening that people get done, as far as I remember. You're not screening. Yeah. No, it's 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 fairly um fairly rare to have you know in antithrombin three deficiency. Um, so no, nothing nothing routine. Okay, how about heparin allergy? Yeah, heparin allergy. So luckily, I've I've not had to see that yet. Um, heparin anaphylaxis is overwhelmingly kind of rare, which is good. Uh, but then of course the uh, the paradigm shifts a little bit, uh, such that we can't give heparin, and so we have to use other anticoagulation. Um, uh, drugs. Um, so the common one that's discussed is is a uh, direct thrombin inhibitor or bivalirudin, um, which uh, which is a um, taken from hirudin, you know, which is in the leech saliva that uh, the leeches use. Uh, and so bivalirudin, this is this is you know, in, if you're if you're if you've got a known uh, heparin allergy, talking to hematology pre case, I might say. In that case, it's not something that you want to organise on table. Um, but you're talking to your hematology colleagues to access the bivalirudin. Um, you're giving a uh, a, a bolus dose and then an infusion dose of bivalirudin. It's got a, a relatively short half time, uh, half life. Um, so uh, you, you're doing that. You're checking your ACT, and uh, some hospitals use an echerin clotting time as a laboratory test to to measure the uh, anticoagulation secondary to bivalirudin. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, the question becomes: at the end of the case, if we're not giving protamine, which is what we normally give for heparin to reverse. The, uh, the anticoagulation and ensure the patient has hemostasis at the end of the operation. Um, there's no specific reversal agent for bivalirudin, so we need to we need to stop that infusion. And it's about half life, as I said, about 20, 25 minutes short half life. So we sort of need to wait for that just to kind of wear off. Oh wow! Okay. Mm. Um, pro protamine and salmon have cross reactivity. Is that right? Yeah, so there's always a bit of a concern about um, increased risk of protamine and anaphylaxis if there's, uh, you know, anaphylaxis to seafood salmon. Uh, there's also could be a risk in males um, who have had vasectomies uh, if there's been exposure to, um, to, to, you know, sperm to the blood, uh, breaking that uh, in that um, uh, blood barrier. Mm. Um, those those are always things that you just keep in the back of your mind when you're administering protamine. Mm, okay, and with heparin allergy, is there any kind of cross reactivity with other drug allergy? So. Oh, um, not not that I know of, though. Perhaps we'll have an immunologist listening that could uh, that could inform us better. But um, not not nothing comes to mind for me. Okay, I think I think that's good. So, really, biggest take home of this whole podcast is get the heparin in, get the ACT right above four hundred and eighty heparin dose, four hundred units per kilogram. And vet, like even though I've not seen it, I've not seen this. <laughs> if you really need the uh, if you really have an, an uh, heparin anaphylaxis patient by valerubin, get the leeches out. Get the hematology. Get the leeches out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Phone a friend. Absolutely. But yes, yes, that's absolutely right. And sorry, I went a little bit off piece there because you're asking what the... Um, that was the second uh, question, actually. So yeah, yeah. So, no, that's good. Fantastic. So uh, yeah, I can answer you first with respect to configuration and what the surgeon will do to, to ensure that we can go on bypass. But as you said, we need a drainage line and we need a return line. Those are sort of the most important things to ensure that the main circuit of bypass is connected. Um, and so once our, our ACT is normalized and, you know, we've, we've got uh, everyone ready to go, um, the surgeon normally asks if everyone's happy for aortic cannulation. Um, so the surgeon will place purse strings within the um, aorta, ascending aorta, um, and these will allow, um, at the end of the case, the, uh, the hole that's created for the cannula to be, to be closed with the minimum of bleeding. So they'll place these purse strings, ask if everyone's happy for aortic cannulation, which is sort of asking if the ACT is good and uh, that the arterial blood pressure is, is amenable to um, cannulation. And normally we're looking at an arterial blood pressure of less than a hundred systolic. And that's just to decrease the risk of aortic dissection. Obviously, if we try to stick a, a fairly large cannula into an aorta with a pressure of 200, then, um, then the risk of, of dissection will increase significantly and your operative time will you know, be directly proportional to that. Uh, to the that. Right aorta, yes. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You've got a lot just more work to, to do that just to, just to clarify, so... They're doing some sutures, not they're mm -hmm. not coming open, but they're doing it in a like say a circular fashion around the aorta, mm -hmm. and that allows the needle to go in, and then once it's out, immediately get clamped. Correct. Yeah. So just on the surface of the aorta is where those purse strings go, um, and then uh, and then they'll make that small incision in the aorta, which allows them to place the aortic cannula. Mm -hmm. Once the aortic cannula is placed, of course, we want to make sure that it's in the right place, uh, and that's where the perfusionist uh, comes in a little bit. 
Um, so the surgeon will connect the arterial line um, that's sitting at the table that the perfusionist control with their pump um, to the aortic cannula that's in the aorta. Um, and that's normally done with the use of an underwater seal, either by the perfusionist flowing up on their line to ensure that there's no bubbles in the line. And that's that's a team sport as well. Everyone needs to be looking at that point to ensure there's no bubbles and no risk of emboli coming up that line. Um, so they'll connect that. Um, the perfusionist will examine the pressure in the aortic line, ensuring that it's the same as the arterial pressure uh, on the radial line as well, and ensure that they can flow normally with that line, basically making sure it's in the right place, that there's no kinks um, no obstruction to that, that it's not sitting up against the wall of the aorta. Uh, similar to, you know, flushing a cannula. When we put a cannula in the back of the hand, we want to give it a little flush, make sure it's not up against anything. Um, uh, this one, of course, is in the aorta, though, so the stakes are a little higher. Um, but the perfusionist will get involved in that, make sure that aorta, uh, aortic line is, is working and working well. Um, and once that's working well, the, the surgeon will move to the venous uh, line or the drainage line. Um, and so for the uh, central configuration of bypass, um, they'll, again, put purse strings in the right atrium, uh, make a small incision in the right atrium, and then usually put a cannula um, into the right atrium. It's a two-stage cannula, oh, sorry, single-stage cannula, two-stage uh, operations um, that uh, will then drain blood from the, you know, IVC and the SVC into the pump. Um, and then we're, we're ready uh, to, to initiate cardiopulmonary bypass. Yeah, right. And the cross clamp is just above the aorta. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the um, uh, the, the uh, like the um, aortic cannula is just above that cross clamp. That stops any backflow into uh, into the coronary arteries. That's right. Yeah. So so for example, for a coronary artery bypass grafting surgery, um, once the, the surgeon's happy with all of their grafts, they're ready to go in terms of you know they can uh, donor from the uh, saphenous vein in the leg. They'll examine that, uh, and then we'll initiate cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, once bypass is initiated, there's sort of a period there, um, and this is probably the, the second thing for the um, an impetus to be specifically aware of. Uh, there'll be a period there where the patient is on bypass, um, so we're draining blood out of the KV into the reservoir through our pump and oxygenator back into the arterial line. Um, but the patient still has normal electrical function of the heart. And so mm. at that point, if there's any issues with uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, the patient says, actually, look, guys, I've got a problem here. Um, they can simply return the blood back to the aorta and the patient's native circulation is still intact. So at this point, we're sort of running with two circulations. We've got the extra corporeal circulation that's that's providing most of the um, most of the, the flow, in fact, all of the flow if you're on full bypass, uh, but then you've still got the uh, the patient's native circulation intact. And usually at this point, the, the surgeon will place an aortic root vent. So this is a small cannula that allows venting of the aorta between the aortic valve and where the cross clamp will go. And this is to help drain the aorta uh, in that region of any blood or to help fill it with blood, which may help uh, attaching their grafts or, um, uh, you know, ensuring flaccidity of the aorta uh, at the end of the case. Uh, following that, um, then the cross clamp goes on. So the cross clamp will go, uh, as you said, sort of proximal to the aortic cannula, close to the aortic valve, um, but above the aortic root vent. Um, and so we need a sort of flaccid aorta at that point. Uh, and so the, the perfusionist will decrease the pressure uh, in the aorta by decreasing flow. Um, the aortic cross clamp will be placed. Uh, and following that, then we can commence uh, cardioplegia and arresting and protecting of that heart and myocardium. Okay. I, th I mean, I think that all makes sense. It really is just um, anatomy and, and logic to this. You've got the clamp, 100%. You've got the aortic cannula above, below you've got a vent. You've got the valve there. You can fill up that spot, uh, that place between the valve and the clamp with blood or take blood away. Um, yeah. And your cardioplegic solution is probably the next thing to talk about. It goes mm. into that, um, that vent. That's uh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a few methods of delivery of cardioplegic solution. Um, so there's sort of antegrade, retrograde, and, and osteal, which is a form of uh, antegrade. So antegrade cardioplegia is exactly what you're describing there. It's when the uh, perfusionist will give cardioplegia through the aortic root vent. And that, if you think conceptually, is, is as I said, sort of distal to the aortic valve, but proximal to the clamp. That will pressurize your aortic root. And assuming that you've got a competent aortic valve so that you don't get retrograde flow into the left ventricle, uh, pressurize that section of the root and which the um, the coronary ostea uh, are coming off for your left main and your right coronary artery, you'll get antegrade flow of, of cardioplegic solution down those coronary arteries, um, which uh, which will then arrest your myocardium. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got a, a competent aortic valve, then antegrade cardioplegic solution and antegrade cardioplegic delivery is uh, is is what's favoured as it uh, as it seems to get the best uh, the best myocardial protection. 
Excellent. And with um, the cardiac police solution, I mean, it, it is a bit crazy. You're literally giving a cardiac arrest dose of potassium and a few other mm. agents. Um, mm. what, what is this solution? What, what, what's the combination? Yeah, absolutely. There's a few different types of, uh, of cardioplegia solution. Um, so St. Helens is the one that, sorry, St. Thomas is, sorry, is the one that's commonly used. Um, and this is, as you say, a sort of hyperkalemic solution. Um, there's a few other, uh, uh, um, uh, a few other electrolytes in there. So, you know, concentrations of sodium chloride, uh, calcium, magnesium, uh, usually bicarbonate. Uh, sometimes lignocaine is added um, to try and decrease the risk of any arrhythmia coming off pump. Um, uh, but St. Uh, St. Thomas's um, uh, hyperkalemic cardioplegia is, is the most common type used. Mm. There's a couple of different types uh, it's called Del Nido and, and Brett Schneider uh, cardioplegia, which are sort of different um, ratios and different balances. As you can imagine in medicine, everyone thinks they can do things a little bit better than the other guys, so they'll change it up a little bit. Uh, and these are used in certain cases to achieve um, different lengths of, of myocardial protection due to the... Um, Due to the individual constituents of those agents, uh, but the uh, the St. Thomas's hyperkalemic one is, is the most common one used. And as you say, it's it's uh, predominantly uh, focusing on its hyperkalemic um, uh, concentration to to induce a diastolic arrest and, and protect that myocardium. And I should mention too, that's often mixed with oxygenated blood as well. Um, the thought being that uh, some amount of oxygenated blood will allow. Um, uh, delivery of oxygen into the myocardium while it's arrested and just sort of have some oxygen around rather than purely crystallization, which of course has has minimal oxygen. And so, of course, even at a rest, the, the heart will have a, a basal metabolic rate. And so the theory being that some oxygen around will, will be useful. Mm. And is it always a cold solution? I, I mean, are you trying, there's obviously not deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. This is making the heart a little bit colder because that might decrease the BMR, basal met metabolic rate? Absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, um, yeah, in my institution for, for um, cardioplegic solutions, we always deliver at four degrees. And this is sometimes accompanied by the surgeon pouring cold water over the heart as well to achieve some, uh, some uh, decrease in temperature as well. And, and you're exactly right, um, decreasing that basal metabolic rate. We know from you know, our studies of, of deep hypothermic circulatory arrest that we get about a 7% decrease in, in uh, oxygen consumption for every degree uh, of tissue cooling uh, that we achieve. And so if we can uh, if we can keep the heart nice and cold, um, as well as inducing diastolic arrest, we really slow down all of the sodium potassium ATPases, help protect those mitochondria, ensure that the myocardium is in the best um, state possible for when we need to start it back up again. Mm, okay. You know, there, there was something they talked about when I tra when I trained which is that this one of the surgeons, uh, you know, they talk about him being kind of the maybe the, I think the grandfather of cardiac surgery in Melbourne, perhaps, or even in Australia, I'm not sure. But oh, yeah. what they say about him was that he wasn't necessarily the best surgeon, but he was an incredibly fast surgeon. And so whatever he lacked in a little, you know, obviously he's very skilled, but a little bit of technical ability, he was so quick that the bypass times were always short and he got he got really good outcomes because of that. What what is your sense of that just the speed and how how important that is to get off bypass quickly super important absolutely important so the two big indices we look at are the total bypass time and the total cross clamp time because that is of course the the time that the heart is not perfused for that cross clamp time um and there's very good data to show that with increasing cross clamp time and increasing bypass time we have all of the uh, you know the really bad effects of bypass uh, more commonly so these are things like rv dysfunction which is a, a really major concern with long bypass cases uh, even lv dysfunction as well things like uh, vasoplegia um, and um, uh, things like significant coagulopathy um, all increase with increasing indices of those times. So um, it's it's an independent measure of, of um, mm. potential complication that, yeah, if, if you can reduce those, then that's fantastic. And, and let's say the difference, so cross-clap, increasing cross-clap time versus increasing bypass time. So cross-clap time will always be longer than bypass time, but is there some kind of sense of the outcomes of one versus the other? So cross clamp time will be will be shorter because oh, we'll we'll yeah initiate bypass first and then once we're happy with bypass we'll put on that cross clamp yeah. once we're ready to to come off we'll take off that cross clamp and we're still on bypass while we're sort of getting the heart going again um, but uh, it, depending on on what's going on sort of during that bypass time if the heart's being used normally um, and with warm blood while the cross clamp's off then uh, uh, there's sort of less complication that will go along with that bypass time um, compared to you know having cross clamp on, of course, uh, any increase in bypass time as a whole is, is bad because then we're getting that, um, you know, the, the 
uh, complications of, of putting blood through a roller pump where we're using an extra portal circuit, exposing blood to membranes that it shouldn't be exposed to. Um, so uh, even though the heart's being perfused and, and you know, the, the uh, myocardial protection might be a little bit better once the cross clamps off and we're just on regular bypass, um, we're yeah. still getting all of those negative effects of having blood exposed to an extra corporeal circuit. Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, so we've, we've talked about the, the most important thing, which is heparin, but is, is there anything else we should know as an anesthetist? You know, you're a trainee training in this cardiac center, you've got your CAGs or your valve operations. Is there anything else that seems really important, things that come up time and time again that you, you, know, you wish you'd known earlier when you started? Yeah, so I think the, um, like the biggest takeaway, uh, in addition to you know, the heparin, is that um, cardiac surgery is a team sport. Uh, and it's really just important to know what the other players in that team sport are doing at different times. And the really uh, intense periods are those periods where we have to interface heavily with, with our surgeon, with our perfusionist, surgeon and perfusionist, um, anaesthetist and perfusionist, anaesthetist and surgeon. Um, and so you, you just want to know what your other what your other team player is doing uh, during that time. And so sort of familiarising yourself as quick as possible with with um, your individual surgeon steps for, for coming on and, and going off bypass and familiarizing yourself with how the perfusionist comes on and goes off bypass. And the, the things that we can uh, directly influence as anaesthetists um, are things like, we, we've mentioned the heparin, but uh, I mentioned the systolic blood pressure at the time of aortic cannulation. So having that as less than 100 uh, is very important. And a lot of surgeons, um, you know, simply won't cannulate the aorta if, uh, if, the, if the blood pressure is at that high. Um, and so ensuring that you're... Um, you know, we mentioned if, if you're sort of waiting around for an ACT following the heparin, that's a problem. And then the blood pressure is high and you're waiting around for that as well. And, you know, it's it's these sort of things that you can really help optimize to, to make the operation move slickly. Similarly, coming off bypass, um, you'll want a, a systolic blood pressure of less than 100 to remove the aortic cannula as well, uh, to decrease the risk of, um, of dissection. Um, and you'll want to know what your what your perfusionist is doing as well. Normally, the perfusionist will try and transfuse some of the blood left in the pump back through the aortic cannula before it's removed. Uh, and so controlling the pressure around those times is very important. The sort of individual flow of that will depend on the institution and depend on the surgeon and perfusionist you're working with. Um, but just, uh, I suppose, being aware of, of, of those things um, will really help you be a team player and really ensure that things move as smoothly as possible. Yeah, excellent. Okay. So, and... and it in terms of blood pressure, I can imagine usually when the blood pressure gets a bit too high, and it's often a temporary thing. I just give a bit more propofol or run a bit more volatile, maybe some more fentanyl. And, and is that generally what you do, or are you, are you there actually giving beta blockers and? No, yeah, no. I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, it's uh, in sort of the classic way of anesthesia. There's no correct uh, antihypertensive to give, <laughs> um, but what as long as head? Yeah, that's it, the one in your hand, absolutely. Um, as long as you're giving something that works relatively quickly. The beta blockers, for example, I'd, I'd be careful of giving something, a long-acting beta blocker, because then, of course, if you're coming off pump and that arm trippy, then you could be in a bit of trouble. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's just using something short-acting to achieve that, uh, whatever that may be, whether that's, you know, propofol, volatile, magnesium, uh, BTN, whatever you like. Yeah. Actually, just to reiterate that, so, yeah, giving long-acting beta blockers in this situation, not great. You want definitely positive inotropy as you're coming off bypass. Absolutely, yeah. And it's I guess it's the uh, the great um, irony of bypass is that, you know, you need a profound anticoagulation at one minute and then the next minute you want everything to clot perfectly. Uh, and yep. it's the same as the heart. You want, you want you know, absolute hypotension at one point, but then you need perfusion the next second. So giving short-acting things is, is, um, is generally a good strategy. Yeah, because that's, that's really, I mean, it's almost reassuring. Like, I know you have to go through extra fellowship training, toe training. You've done your bypass training and ECMO training. But really, when you're there, you've got a often a very, very sick heart, or you know, especially if it's you know the cardiomyopathies having the you know complex VAD operations or valves with really you know severe valves plus heart failure. Mm. But you know, often it is just a um, acute coronary syndrome, and the patient is okay. And if you get the blood pressure stuff right, the heparin and ACT right, um, as a trainee, I think you know you're a long way to just doing really well in that in that section or that in that case or that rotation absolutely absolutely and if you can yeah if, if you're doing all those things well and you're even grasping you know a little bit of the stuff we're talking about because it's obviously a very busy time um then then you're doing great that's absolutely right yeah doing fantastic it, the other stuff i wanted to know i remember looking at um you know uh, essentially when you're on bypass it's non pulse high flow you just have this blood pressure and then mm. the flow as you know generated by the um, bypass machine probably um 
uh, regulated by the perfusionist. Um, yeah. Often the blood pressure the blood pressure line would go down to around fifty or sixty, and in my mind, mm. I was like, oh, you know, is this right? So, do you care too much about pressure if you have enough flow generation? Yeah, yeah, that's that's such a good question. Um, so the the interplay between between flow and pressure is is sort of complex and difficult to. Uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of studies uh, about this and, and what the optimum flow, what the optimum pressure is. Um, so uh, you've correctly identified, yeah, I think that that pressure is not flow. And we get really used to as an ethicist equating the two because we often look at um, blood pressure as a, as a surrogate of flow. Um, and we know that, you know, certain organ beds will uh, autoregulate uh, at certain pressures to ensure a good flow. Uh, and so when we're anesthetizing a patient for a lap appendix or a lap poly, we'll use our blood pressure as our, our surrogate for organ perfusion and organ flow. Now, it's a little bit different when we're on bypass because um, we have so many more indices to look at. Uh, we can, as you say, dial up a, a specific flow on our pump. Um, we can look at the uh, oxygenation of the blood uh, and calculate, you know, using our oxygen flux equation, the delivery of oxygen um, that's, uh, that's going through our arterial line into the patient. Um, we can index this to the patient's body surface area and we come out with an indexed delivery of oxygen equation. The question becomes, of course, um, what is the best flow to give? Um, I'll talk about pressure first, and then I'll come back to that, I suppose. So with respect to perfusion pressure, um, it, it, the equation is the exact same. You know, it's just Ohm's law again. I suppose that the blood pressure is, is equal to cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. That's the same as perfusion pressure, just equal to your pump output uh, multiplied by your systemic vascular resistance. As you've, as you've said correctly, there's a few um, sort of subtle differences. Uh, we normally have pulsatile flow uh, in, in regular patients. And so systemic vascular resistance has components of, you know, arterial elastins, uh, you know, reflection of, of pressures, uh, inertia of blood, um, whereas that's that's not the case on bypass. It's mostly a non-pulsatile flow line delivered by the pump. Um, we are able to deliver some pulsatile flow by, by uh, certain pumps will have um, settings to be able to do this, but it doesn't seem to improve outcomes, um, so people don't ever do it. Um, but we deliver non-pulsatile flow, and so systemic vascular resistance sort of becomes um, a... Uh, a function of um, just pure friction of blood moving through uh, arteries, plus uh, a really important thing that we often forget about but is important for cardiopulmonary bypass is the viscosity of blood. Um, so viscosity, we, we know affects systemic vascular resistance, but at you know 36 to 37 degrees in, in normal therapeutic patients like we have, it's uh, mostly relatively unchanging. You know, if you have hematocrits 25 to 35 probably going to be relatively similar and won't affect your systemic vascular resistance as much as um, you know, any, any, uh, any, um, uh, say drugs or, you know, neural or hormonal regulatory factors will mm. on bypass. Of course, we, we vary the temperature of our patient quite significantly, um, such that, uh, a, a viscosity of the viscosity of blood at a hematic rate of about 40, um, at a temperature of 37 degrees is, is pretty much equal to the viscosity of blood at a hematic rate of 25 when we get the patient down to 25 degrees. Now we don't cool the patient for every case, mind you, for, for things like cardio, uh, for, cabbages and, and cases like this, uh, we'll sort of use a tepid bypass at, you know, 35-ish degrees. Um, and so that's that might not be a factor, but once we're doing larger cases with, with deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, viscosity becomes a significant proportion of our systemic vascular resistance. Um, and so we have to take that into, a, into account. Um, oftentimes we do get a significant amount of hemo dilution once we go on pump because we prime the pump with crystalloid solutions, uh, but we can also prime the pump with blood solutions. And so uh, we need to think about viscosity when looking at systemic vascular resistance. So that's sort of one part of the equation, I guess, systemic vascular resistance when we're talking about diffusion pressure. Um, the other part is, is pump output, and that's uh, easily varied by just changing how fast the pump is running. Uh, so that's the beauty of perfusion, I guess, is that we can control that a little bit easier than we can control um, you know, cardiac output in a, in a, in a normal patient. Um, and so then the question becomes, I suppose, what kind of perfusion pressure do we target? Um, and there's, there's been a lot of studies on this, um, and there's sort of not one consensus, uh, because different regional circulations, as, as we know, auto-regulate at different pressures, uh, and this may be affected by, um, temperature if we're cooling the patient significantly um, and may be affected uh, by, by sort of other interplays of bypass as well. Um, and so it becomes it becomes a little bit tricky. Uh, what, what perfusion pressure do we target? Great question. Um, somewhere between 60 to 80 is probably what most people do. Sometimes dropping down to 50 is not so bad because we'll still be getting 
uh, good autoregulation to the brain, which is obviously the main organ we're concerned about. And there's good studies to show that regional circulation to the brain and regional autoregulation of the brain remains intact uh, for different um, carbon dioxide tensions, regardless of temperature. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it might be a little bit left shifted. So I think 50 to 150 is the, or maybe 60 to 160 are the numbers that people commonly remember for the primary exam in terms of uh, what flow is maintained regardless of, you know, pressure uh, delivered to the brain. So that might be slightly less shifted in bypass, so maybe 40 to 140-ish. Um, and so those lower flows, uh, lower pressures, sorry, where we're ensuring that the uh, the brain is still perfused uh, yeah. well. Hey, so, so, I mean, that's sorry. interesting. 50 to 80, oh, sorry, 60 to 80 as a, a map reading or the arterial line reading on non positive flow is reasonable. Why wouldn't yeah. you just aim at 80 to be sure? Yeah, I mean, you could, uh, but of course you might get sort of more, um, more complications, more bleeding. Uh, you'll often have to run your pump faster or deliver certain drugs to achieve yep. that. And of course, uh, that becomes the second part of the conversation is that pressure is not the only determinant, as you said. Yep. Pressure is just what we use as a surrogate. And because we can see our flow and calculate our, um, our delivery of oxygen, then we have to look at flow as well. So looking at pressure, um, if, if, we just, if we just took pressure into account, and I guess to uh, you know, use a, a, a very, um, mm. to, to uh, augment an analogy with a significant amount of hyperbole, if we had an aortic cannula uh, in the aorta and then a cross clamp distal to that and somehow measured the pressure in there, then that pressure would be pretty good uh, at, at a really, really low flow. Mm. Um, what I'm saying is our systemic vascular resistance is extremely high then even at small flows, our pressure will be good. But that obviously doesn't ensure that we've got good delivery of oxygen to tissues. And so as you've correctly identified, that's where kind of flow comes in as well. Mm. And so what flow is the correct flow? That's a great question as well. So um, I suppose if we look at what, what we're, our outcomes that we're trying to achieve is an adequate delivery of oxygen to meet oxygen consumption. So adequate DO2 versus VO2. Mm. Um, the question becomes then what's the VO2 in a patient who's anaesthetized, paralyzed at you know, 34, 35 degrees? Really difficult question. Um, which oh, can, oh, isn't, isn't the answer less than one met? That... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot is the answer. Not a lot, yeah. So, so we can use a lot of um, indices to help um, help estimate this. Uh, so we can look at our venous oxygen saturations um, compared to our the amount of oxygen we're delivering, and that's of course with uh, fixed bore as well. Um, help uh, calculate our our uh, consumption of oxygen. Um, but this is a little bit fraught because, of course, if we're not perfusing certain uh, regional circulations that well, then we won't have oxygen uptake. Um, and we might think that we're delivering a, uh, a good um, delivery of oxygen because our saturated venous sets are normal or high when, in fact, we're simply not perfusing an organ at all or not perfusing it adequately. Hmm. And so we can use other indices as well. We can use lactate. We can use pH. Um, and we can use end organ monitors as well. So the NERS is something that's uh, that's used somewhat controversially at times, near infrared spectroscopy, looking at brain perfusion and ensuring that we've got a relatively good brain perfusion by extrapolating from saturation of oxygen in the brain, mm. uh, and looking at things like urine output to ensure that you know we're still perfusing the kidneys, um, that they're still performing the function that they're doing. Um, just, just to, I think the sound went out there, but yeah, just look at urine output, make sure we're perfusing the kidneys, NERS or near infrared spectro spectrometry. That may yes, be trusted, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that that can that can sort of be um, indicators of of uh, of adequate DO two in in the face of VO two. As I said, venous saturations can be useful, but they're really only useful if we get a really low venous saturations. Then we know that our oxygen uptake is significant, which means either our delivery of oxygen is inadequate or our consumption of oxygen has increased significantly. And so we need to vary one of those. Okay. Um, Putting all of it together, <laughs> it seems that studies show that flows of somewhere between 2.2 to 2.4 liters per minute per meter squared uh, is is ideal, uh, and then you know pressure is kind of in that 60 to 60 to 80, aiming at a map of maybe 70 ish uh, is ideal. So if we can achieve both of those things um, by varying our SBR and ensuring our flows are at that 2.4 to 2.2 to 2.4 liters per minute per meter squared, uh, then most of the time we'll, we'll be ensuring that our perfusion is adequate. What's the, what's the average kind of body surface area just to get some whole numbers in there? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we use, there's a whole bunch of uh, formulas to calculate body surface area, but the Dubois formula is probably, probably the most commonly used. It's one of these formulas that has like kilos to the power of 0 0.076 and, you know, plug it into a calculator. Don't bother yeah. trying to work it out. Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. But somewhere between sort of 1.5 to 2.5 are, are the numbers we see for most people. 
Okay, yeah, 1.525, meaning that your flow rates are roughly what you'd expect, like five liters per minute type thing? Correct, right? yeah. Yeah, the flow rates that we commonly see are, you know, between four and four and six liters per minute on the pump. Okay. Hey, I mean, in the last, I think, maybe go for another 10 minutes, but um, I, I really wanted to get onto the whole crashing onto bypass. You know, there's there's the old joke that mm. cardiac anesthesia is easy, it's just half an anesthetic, you put them to sleep, you don't even have to wake them up. So easy. That's it. <laughs> Um, it, you, get some sick, <laughs> you get some sick hearts though. And, you know, induction time is a time that's, you know, again, fraught with massive cardiovascular changes. That's assuming you don't have any problems with your oxygenation and your airway management and everything else that can kind of go wrong. Um, mm. Crashing onto bypass is the thing where I think they talk about, look, if things go wrong, you just crash onto bypass, easy, patient is safe. What, what what's What's your perception of this and have you had to do it? Have you... Yeah, 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 yeah. Certainly been done, um, and certainly doable. I think the uh, the um, important takeaway is that you have to do it kind of pragmatically. Um, so if if you've planned to do it, and if you've discussed it with the team, then it's certainly something that's achievable. Uh, so if you've identified a patient, say you've got a, a redo patient, so they've had a previous stenotomy, uh, we're entering the chest again, um, and it's potentially a hostile reentry because of um, adhesions. There's yeah adhesions, and because there's a uh, scarring through the chest. Um, then, uh, then that would be a, a time, for example, that um, that a potential crash onto bypass is, is uh, something that might need to be done. And so if you're pragmatic with your approach, it certainly can be done. And I think pragmatism in this case means that the, the surgeon's aware um, that, that this is a potential option, as well as the anethonist and the perfusionist, that you have a primed pump in the room as well as a perfusionist in the room as well. And that uh, in the time when the surgeon's setting up to, to go on to bypass, because of course, say you're doing that reduced anatomy and, and your sternal sore, uh, ruptures the right ventricle. Um, in the time between rupturing that right ventricle and potentially crashing onto bypass, you're obviously going to have pretty significant blood loss. Uh, yeah. And so you need the members of the team to ensure that there's uh, there's something in place to ensure some amount of perfusion during that time. So often the anesthetist will have four units of uh, packed red cells in the room, just in case. Uh, we'll have a cell saver set up for the surgeon to use. Um, and if you're really concerned, you can almost sort of uh, put put steps in place to ensure that the crashing onto bypass is a little bit quicker. So, say putting wires into the femoral artery and the femoral vein to, to uh, in case there's say a rupture of that right ventricle, like I was talking about, quickly put cannula into the femoral artery, femoral vein, jump onto bypass, and, and go for it. So, if it's sort of done um, done pragmatically and the team's aware, then absolutely an option. Uh, if it's one of those things where you know you're you're playing a bit fast and loose, and after it just goes wrong, we'll crash onto bypass. Then you know you're sort of looking at if there's no pump in the room, the perfusionist isn't there. There's no pump set up. You're looking at maybe 20 minutes or so before that happens. And so yeah. is it, it comes to disaster. Yeah, everything set up, everything ready. What's the time frame between disaster and bypass? Yeah, uh, remarkably quick uh, time. So say we had say we had those uh, those wires in the groin, or even if we didn't um, wires in the groin, and there was that RV rupture. Um, we're talking, you know, a, a minute or two, really. Um, mm. Have our scrub nurses ready with all of the equipment. Surgeon bangs those lines in, and then um, the other issue is, of course, anticoagulation because we don't have time to test and wait for an ACT in that case. And so the anaesthetist will often give a large bolus of heparin. The perfusion will give a large bolus of heparin to the pump, uh, and then we all hope that it works really well. Yeah. Wow. Um, and yeah. I mean, that was a particular example of, like, say, a reduced anatomy causing a, you know, rupture of the right ventricle or whatever. How about mm. You know, patients got a really sick heart. Induction causes. Uh, th this feels like it's really rare because I think the sicker the patient is, the less you need of anything really to get them Absolutely. to sleep. But um, yeah, sick heart, induction of anesthesia, patient arrests or peri arrest, mm -hmm. but you know, severely compromised. Has that been? Is that also a doable thing? Pressing yeah, up? for sure. And and again, it's it's just that uh, it's about the pragmatism at the time, just about correct patient identification. So if you've got a you know left main that's at ninety nine percent with significant segmental wall dysfunction and an EF of ten percent, then uh, mm. you know you you're going to have everyone in the room ready to go at, at the time of induction. It's not you know let the drink in juice while you're out getting coffee kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's that sort of case. So it really comes down to to correct patient identification and getting the team on board and ensuring everyone has a sort of shared mental model of what's going on. Okay. Um, and again, the time frame, that the, everyone's ready. You're about to do the anesthetic, so not, mm -hmm. he's not even there yet. Bypass mm -hmm. time from induction arrest to bypass. What do you reckon? Yeah, again, again, can be minutes depending on the, the type of configuration that the surgeon uses. So peripheral or central, if you're using a peripheral uh, configuration, getting some, some wires and cannulae in can be very, very rapid. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. No, that's really, really interesting to know. Um, have you had it? You know, when when things go wrong, I think is 
like there's this whole machine there, you know, bypass circuitry. How is mm. it just doesn't fail? Like this is like an extreme yeah. redundant, like good redundancy, good technology, zero fail rates. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. I mean, it's it's that's that's uh, absolutely right on those first accounts. Very, very good redundancy. Very, very good technology. These things are engineered extremely well. Um, I often use the analogy of you know airplanes. And that it's sort of like a, a really well engineered airplane, but Boeing's probably proved me wrong in the last couple of weeks with respect to that. <laughs> I'll stop using that analogy. <laughs> but, uh, um, it's a uh, very well engineered pieces of equipment um, that are sort of regularly serviced. These, uh, these headphones might be on the blink. I apologize, uh, um, but are very well serviced, and uh, it, it's sort of about ensuring the um, safety checks and and sort of that the safety culture of, of perfusion is in place for these machines. So again, if you're playing fast and loose and and, and not um, adhering to the specific sort of protocols of, of your institution, you'll probably find yourself in trouble. But if you're doing everything that should be done at the right time um, and and ensuring that you know you're, you're sort of there early to make sure that the pumps are ready to go, that you've checked uh, things that can go wrong, um, then normally the equipment uh, is is very reliable in itself, and it would be extremely rare to have you know a, an oxygenator failure. Though of course it does happen from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, and so then difficulties can arise, say, for example, so I mean, for elective, you know, uh, uh, cases, then that's that's all fine and well and good. But say you're weaning from bypass or something and and part of the pump was um, was, you know, not primed or say certain sensors are turned off to prepare for packing up the pump. And then then you had to crash back onto bypass for some reason. Say the RV failed because it got some air through the right coronary or something like that. That's sort of the time when you have to not only ensure that your safety checks are in place, but just um uh, be sort of very vigilant and present of mind for any kind of booby traps that you might have set for yourself in the pump. Yeah, okay. Hey, so have you had any just real kind of moments where you're like, man, that, that was a scary experience. We had to do something a bit out, you know, out, outside of the plan or, or you followed a set of procedures extremely well. Any, any just like very harrowing experiences that kind of resulted in a pretty good outcome regardless? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of... Um, Things, you know, I, I, perfusion is kind of analogous to anesthesia in that 99% of the time you're just going through the motions doing the things that you do every day. And then 1% of the time you're absolutely scared out of your mind. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, that's, 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 that's certainly the case. And, you know, we've certainly had some of those, uh, those examples. The one that I gave before of, of coming off bypass and sort of everything going well. Uh, in the first instance, um, the heart looks like it's functioning well, you know, surgical things that good uh the toes looking great the valve repair has gone well whatever it might be um had a few cases of, of that happening you're sort of getting the pump ready to be wheeled back into the room and dismantled uh and then something goes wrong and having to rush the pump back in connect back up to the patient talked about those big boluses of heparin straight into the pump so the patient's not anticoagulated um that you've tested anymore and so you're crashing back on and you know certainly your heart rates through the roof and uh and wow. you're dreaming of those days when everything went smoothly <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that's why they pay you the big bucks. And the, <laughs> um, hey, I mean, I, I do remember a lot of these cases. You know, you, you talk about these cases like the 99% left main uh, occlusion plus severely compromised ejection and fraction of like 10%. And, you know, I've had a few cases over the years where it's not uh, like it's not acute coronary syndrome, but it's more of a, you know, just chronic heart failure, cardiomyopathy mm -hmm. type situation where the LV EF is anywhere from 10 to 15%. I mean, you know, we we just got through those cases, you know, run, you know, running adrenaline, running, um, you know, ef having ephedrine and metaraminol on hand, giving literally nothing, just midazolam, rock, and a massive dose of fentanyl. But you know, this groin dissection kind of case, um, and yeah, yeah. Know, we get through that induction. But is there a number there? Again, it, obviously, it's very hard because every patient's different. But let's say, for an example, just an elderly male, severe cardiomyopathy, EF ten percent. Oh, sorry. What EF in that kind of situation would you say, look, this is extremely, extremely dangerous. Like this is a 99%, this patient will need bypass or some kind of level level of like mechanical support that your drugs won't be able to give in a non-cardiac setting. Is, is there, a, do you have a sense of that? Um, in a non-cardiac setting, probably, you know, probably not. I think I'd be more than happy to, you know, run patients for the sort of more minor cases on, on low EFs without uh, extra corporeal support. And of course, patient selection is, is a really important thing for, for uh, ECMO in those cases uh, yeah. and ensuring that there's, there's a good indication, there's a good plan in terms of, you know, ECMO as a bridge to what exactly. Um, oh, as uh, in, this, is, this is a, a totally... Like a, a patient comes in bad heart for a, 
urgent non-cardiac procedure, but is there yep. like, yeah, like an EF that you just go, yep, that's, that's too, da- that's too dangerous. I wouldn't touch this except in a cardiac setting with ECMO bypass, whatever ready. Yeah, uh, no, not really. Um, I think you know, as, as you as you say, you sort of you sort of get through and and you you use uh, use your medications um, as you need, and uh, depending on the complexity of the surgery, as you say, all those patient specific factors. An important thing to remember is that um, you know, uh, bypass and, and and ECMO has all of those uh, significant complications associated with them, and and one of those things is a big hit to the LV and RV uh, following a bypass run. So it'd be very very rare to use you know bypass for a patient for a non cardiac surgery. Maybe ECMO for something that needs to be used where you you know can't ventilate or something during during that yeah. case. Um, but uh, you know, a good rule of thumb for for bypass cases is that um, yeah, LV EF may be impacted by about. 10% uh, following the weaning from bypass until you establish normal perfusion and give it time to rest. So, um, you know, putting a patient with an EF of 10% on bypass is, uh, is a, a pretty significant kind of thing to do uh, because it means that the weaning of bypass is going to be very, very complex. And I think in that case, the, you know, the risk benefit, the harm and the insult that the bypass might do, I think is probably more risky than, you know, giving a big dose of, of, of Fent running your adrenaline or your ephedrine or whatever it might be. Um, and, uh, you know, giving very, very minimal amounts of drugs versus, you know, trying to put them on an extracorporeal circuit and dealing with all of the complications that arise following that. Yeah. Actually, so this is actually a really interesting point that probably uh, worthwhile kind of um, drawing out. So, you know, mm. you get a sick patient in a non-cardiac setting and they've got, l- let's say it's an urgent operation, at some level of urgency, and most, even most elective operations are at some stage going to be a bit more urgent. Um, mm. Yeah, there's sounds like there's no real win here. Like you really have to decide for this patient at the time, can this patient, you know, do we want this surgery right here, knowing the incredible risks in the perioperative period rather than anything. And that, you know, bypass isn't isn't a win here. It's not like the golden ticket that just gets this patient out of the out of the problem. If you decide to do the anesthetic, you know, you you will have to take it with all its risks. And this patient has an incredibly high risk. And really they have to go in with it with the yeah, with the presence of mind or the um, consent process saying that this is going to be extremely, you know, potentially, you know, 5, 10, 20% mortality in the next 30 days kind of thing. And when you're at the cold front with an urgent procedure, I think the one I remember was a neck fast in the groin, you're like, well, we've got to do this because either way, this patient is not going to do too well. Um, so that, that's really yeah. reassuring to hear that, Grant. So either way, you have to kind of crack on and make yeah. that decision irrespective of bypass and cardiac anesthesia. That's right. And I think you've summed it up really well, but it's really a constellation of those, you know, patient anesthetic surgical factors, knowing the patient well and having a, you know, a good discussion with them and their family members about what their goals of care are, what the potential complications of the surgery are. Um, and, and as as exactly what you've said, I really can't stress that enough, that like that the availability or the potential to put someone on on bypass or ECMO uh, doesn't mean that it's just simply a helicopter out of a difficult situation. There's often um the, the risks and complications associated with that, uh, especially in a in a sick patient, um, mm. uh, especially potentially in an emergent or unplanned setting, uh, often outweigh, outweigh the benefits. And and um, mm. uh, the complexity is is such that, um, as you've said, knowing the patient, knowing those factors, and having that discussion is probably the most important thing, rather than you know mm. relying on these technologies that uh, that present their own specific issues. Yeah. Right. Hey, Grant, that's been a really, really great chat. Is there any other things that you, know, you find that uh, I may have not asked or missed and are worth mentioning before we wrap it up? Um, I think, you know, I, just just those things that we talked about initially, I think I've sort of peppered them throughout. But, um, you know, it's, it's it's a team sport, just relying on on the people who work around you, your surgeon, your perfusionist, your anaesthetist, whichever role you're taking in that team is, is super important. Knowing what they're doing and respecting what they're doing is important. Um, and I haven't actually mentioned this yet, but the importance of closed loop communication on the initiation and, and the meaning of bypass is so important. So saying what you're doing, getting that call back to you, and then if someone's you know saying what they're doing, calling that back to them as well. So everyone sort of understands they're on the same page. That um, the, those human factors are, I think, some of the most important parts mm-hmm. of um, you know going on and coming off bypass. Um, so I think that's that's a that's a pretty, pretty think- significant takeaway for anyone going into these theaters. I think that's really important. I mean, it actually frustrates me. It sounds like um, you, you know you guys are creating the culture where it, there is that army style closed loop communication. Nothing that is said isn't repeated back with uh, any kind of misunderstanding. I think the time I really, I mean, I I I, I probably get a bit passive aggressive at sometimes. I say, you know, 
I'm doing this. And if I don't get an acknowledgement, I say it again until I do it because I, I really want to hear that feedback. And surgeons are incredibly task focused. So that's not their natural reaction. I think if, as a junior, the way to practice this is baby. So cesarean section, baby's out. I say giving, you know, giving carbitocin, giving oxytocin. And if I don't get a reply, I get a, mm, I go, just to clarify, I'm giving. And I just keep saying that until they say yes. And I think yeah, it's- yeah, yeah. We absolutely have to get this as a as a thing, whether it's with my assistant, my nurse, my junior, my senior surgeon, it has to happen. Absolutely. Because ultimately we're all very good at those specific technical things that we're good at doing as anesthetists or surgeons or confusionists, but it's mm -hmm. always the interplay and the interface where maybe we don't understand exactly what that other person's doing at that time, or they don't understand what we're doing. And there's a breakdown of those human factors. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Excellent. Hey Grant, thank you so much for your time. Like, I, I, it's 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 funny to think I've been a consultant for this long, and obviously a while since I've done any cardiac anesthesia, uh, but I, I've learned so much from that from this chat. So I hope everyone you know really got a lot out of this. It's been it's been great. Thanks for no, having thanks, me board. thanks, thanks so much to you, Lahiri. Thanks for having me on, and uh, you know, shout out to everyone at the uh, at the PA hospital, all the great cardiac anesthetists and perfusionists, the surgeons <laughs> and the nurses. Just want to say thanks to those guys, uh, and thank you as well. Thanks for for having the podcast and sort of making this accessible for everyone. It's uh, the great service that you do so thank you excellent oh thanks grant um all the best um and please share this with anyone who might be interested that's abc's anesthesia uh, on youtube and on our podcast and see you next time thanks a lot now what's new with abc's of anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey from medical student to procedural skills from foundations in anesthesia as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well